friendship register, which should be on the uh, on the pew on the inside towards the center of the church, and so that we might get to know you better. If you're worshiping with us online, we are very glad to have you joining with us. Uh, you are joining the live stream of the 11 o'clock traditional service. We also have a 9 o'clock informal service uh, in another uh, room in our building. Couple of announcements. Uh, we have a congregational meeting next Sunday at 10.45. So next Sunday, 10.45. When would, uh, when would you need to be here? Okay, because we need a quorum to, to get our work done. So next Sunday at 10.45. Uh, we're also starting small groups for Advent. We have a, a small group adult study. And if you'd like to find some community in this church, uh, we do invite you to check out the small group study that's coming uh, it'll be starting next Sunday as well, is that correct? Although there'll be some groups meeting during the week and other times. Uh, Carol's in uh, keyboards is coming up, and um, I'll invite Mark Hedberg to come forward and speak to that. Good morning. Carol's in keyboards is coming. It's December 1st and 2nd. That's a week from Thursday. For those of you who lost two weeks in November someplace, it's a week from Thursday. We need three things. One, we need you all to come. Doors open at six, no tickets required, show starts at seven, December 1st and 2nd. Two, we need you to volunteer. We're gonna decorate the church today at two o'clock and next Sunday at two o'clock. We'd welcome your attendance then. There's a sign up online to help volunteer with the actual event. We'd encourage you to do that. Three, we still need more financial support. The budget this year is over $20,000. We've barely raised a third of that so far. So if you are able and can give us some consideration about that, we'd appreciate that too. But most importantly, come December 1st and 2nd. That's a week from Thursday. Thank you. Now invite uh, uh, our new uh, members and forward so that we can introduce them to you, at least some of them. On uh, behalf of the session, I present uh, Tom and Donna Ray Barrow and Hans and Hannah Schlechter uh, for membership in the church. Um, the Barrows were received in the nine o'clock meeting, but this is by way of introduction. They moved to Richmond from Virginia Beach one year ago. Tom was baptized at First Christian Church in Falls Church, Virginia, and is joining by letter of transfer from there. He's an ordained elder. He's currently a government contractor and is a U.S. Navy retiree. Thank you for your service. Tom plays handbells in our handbell choir, and Donna was baptized in Iceland. She was the resource director at Presbytery of Eastern Virginia. She's very crafty and a master gardener. Uh, they are both uh, active beekeepers. Also present for membership, Hannah and Hans Schlechter. They got married a year ago. They met at Campus Church at Cornell. Hannah is baptized and is joining by letter of transfer from Covenant Presbyterian in Stanton, Virginia. Co Covenant Presbyterian. Hans is, a bapti is baptized and is joining by letter of transfer from Trinity UCC in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. Hans sings in the church chancel choir and he plays bells in our bell choir. Hannah is a ESL professor at VCU and her special interests include linguistics, art, and cooking. In baptism, you were claimed by God and marked as Christ's own forever and joined to his body by the Holy Spirit. You come to us not as strangers then, you come to us as members of the body already, even as you join this church. And so uh, we rejoice that you join the church. We do invite you to profess your faith again uh, with these questions. Do you trust in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? Do you? 
Will you be Christ's faithful disciple, obeying his word and showing his love, will you? And will you be a faithful member of this congregation, share in its worship and mission through your prayers and gifts, your study and service, and so fulfill your calling to be a disciple of Jesus Christ, will you? Let us pray. <clears throat> Holy God, thank you for calling us to be your people and joining us to Christ's body, the church. We praise you for leading Tom, Donna, Hans, and Hannah to this congregation. Empower us by your spirit that we might love one another as Christ loved us, honoring him in all that we say and do, giving our lives in service to others through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Amen. We welcome you to the ministry and the life of this congregation. Praise God. Welcome. I, I also want to share with you that at the 9 o'clock service, we also welcomed Kirk and Jill Kinnear into the life of this church. And uh, we'll introduce them in this service at a later time. Thank you. Meet afterwards. Yes, meet us, meet us following, uh, in, we're going to have fellowship and refreshments following the service, and so uh, be sure to stop by and shake hands and get to know them. Join me in the sentences of scripture. Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. Know that the Lord is God. God created us. Enter his states with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. For the Lord is good. God's steadfast love endures forever. O oh Lord, your faithfulness does endure through all generations. And as we gather here on the Sunday before Thanksgiving, fill our hearts with gratitude for all the gifts that you've given us and all the blessings that you've bestowed upon us, Lord, so that we might have what we need for life and new life in Christ. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let us rise in body and or in spirit and sing hymn number 367.
You may be seated. Friends, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. In humility and faith and with thanksgiving, let us confess our sins to God, first in silent personal confession and then corporately by reciting the prayer of confession printed in your worship guide. Let us go to the Lord in prayer. Now let us pray together. Creator God, in this season of thanksgiving, remind us that every good and perfect gift comes from you. We confess that even in moments of gratitude, we fall short. We feel thankful for the gifts without acknowledging the giver. We praise your beautiful creation without drawing close to you, our maker. We enjoy our abundance without thinking that you intend to share it with others. Forgive us for Christ's sake. Reveal yourself to us in every good gift and give us eyes to see you in them. Amen. Friends, believe the good news of the gospel. Amen. There's something about peace that is so very valuable, especially this day and age, and especially walking into um, our Thanksgiving celebration this coming Thursday. We all come from families of all different shapes and sizes, beliefs. They come with their own book of laws. They come with their own hurts and pains, sorrows, celebrations and joys. But as we gather this week, let us be mindful of the peace that surpasses all understanding that is ours in Christ Jesus and draw on that peace as we celebrate with grateful and thankful hearts this coming Thursday. I lift this up to you and also say to you, the peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Please extend peace to one another. Peace of Christ.
Let us pray. O Holy One, we step forth in this moment towards the reading of your word and the messages of this day. We ask that you open up our minds and our hearts to receive thy word so that we may learn, follow you better, and walk in your ways out in the world. In Jesus Christ's holy name we pray. Amen. Amen. Hey, Peter. It's me and you, kid. Let's say hi to our folks at home in case our young friends are there. How are you? Oh, hello. When did you sneak in? How are you? I didn't see you over there. Well, fabulous. I have two friends. That's awesome. So, got a question for you guys. Um, do you remember us talking a lot about the prophet Elijah? All right, do you remember one of the miracles that we talked about? The big one? On the altar. Yeah. You want to say that really loud? That's right. And he, def he um, our God, through God's power, Elijah proved who the one true God was, didn't he? Yes. And did the false prophets get the fire from heaven? No, no, Elijah. Elijah had the miracle through God's power. Well, Pastor Ray is going to tell uh, the young at heart out here a new story today, and it's about Elisha. So we have Elijah and Elisha. Isn't that something? Do you know who Elisha might be? No? How about... Oh, well, you know who he was? He was a follower of Elijah, a follower. He wanted to be a prophet just like Elijah. So he listened to him and watched him and learned from him. And when it was time for Elijah to go up to heaven and be with God forever, Elisha took the reins and he became the prophet of the people. And by then there were more prophets to support him. So it got me to thinking about something, because we follow who? We follow God. And who's God's son? So yeah, we follow Jesus' lessons, don't we? So I got to thinking about this. You know, 900 years later, the Apostle Paul talked about spiritual gifts. The spiritual gifts. And he does this in Romans chapter 12. And there are, you want to guess how many? Spiritual glyphs, he names? Seven. Seven's a cool number in the Christian faith. We like the number seven. We like the number three, and we like the number seven. So there are seven spiritual gifts. And I got to thinking, we are followers of Christ, and God has given us spiritual gifts, just like he gave Elijah and Elisha. And I was thinking, I'm going to read these out loud. I'm going to ask all the folks out there to help us, too. So when I read these gifts out loud, I want you to raise your hand if someone comes to mind when I read this gift, okay? I'm going to give the gift and a little definition. All right, so do you know anybody in your life, in your faith life, that is gifted in prophesizing, which means pointing others to God and helping them see what is right and wrong in God's eyes? Do you know anybody? I do. Anybody? Anybody out there? No hands? You don't know anybody that teaches you right from wrong in the ways of God? Yeah, nobody teaching you right from wrong? Church? What about your mom and dad? Uh, <laughs> all right, here's the next one. This one's good. This one's really good. This one's good. All right, serving, meeting the needs of others, serving people. Do you know anybody who is really good at serving people? Uh, I do. How about you guys? <gasps> All right, now think about this one, teaching, teaching, helping others understand God's word and the Bible. Do you know any teacher types? I do. All right, how about encouraging the gift of encouraging, coming alongside someone to help them grow closer to Jesus. Do you know anybody who's encouraging? I do. How about giving? 
those who give money and gifts to support the church and help people. Yeah. Oh, I, you, I think so too. That's good. That's really good. We all know. Very, very good. Leading, leading others in serving God. Do you know anybody who has the gift of leadership? I do. How about last one, showing mercy, showing kindness and love to others. Do you know anybody like that? Wow, I do too. We have such an amazing faith family, but each of us are called to these spiritual gifts in different ways. Some of us might be better at or more called by God in one area. I'd like to think that showing mercy is a spiritual gift that God gave me. Now, I'd like you to think really hard about who you are and who you're growing up to be. And does any one of these gifts kind of resonate with you? You know, the gift of giving, the gift of showing mercy, leading, encouraging, teaching, serving, and prophesizing. And think about that. And what I want you to also think about as you leave to go to worship in Richmond, I want you to think about who in your life are you following and learning from to help with this gift that God gave you. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let us all pray together. Dear God, thank you for Jesus. Thank you for our spiritual gifts. Help us look to Jesus to, to learn about ourselves and share our spiritual gifts with others. Amen. 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 All right. You want to head out? Our scripture for today comes from 2 Kings chapter 2, verses 1 through 12. Hear the word of God. Now when the Lord was about to take Elijah up to heaven by a whirlwind, Elijah and Elisha were on their way from Gilgal. Elijah said to Elisha, stay here, for the Lord has sent me as far as Bethel. But Elisha said, as the Lord lives, and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. So they went down to Bethel. The company of prophets who were at Bethel came out to Elisha and said to him, Do you know that today the Lord will take your master away from you? And he said, Yes, I know. Keep silent. Elijah said to him, Elisha, stay here, for the Lord has sent me to Jericho. But he said, as the Lord lives and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. And so they came to Jericho. The company of prophets who were at Jericho drew near to Elisha and said to him, Do you know that today the Lord will take your master away from you? And he answered, Yes, I know. Be silent. And then Elijah said to him, Stay here. For the Lord has sent me to the Jordan. But he said, as the Lord lives and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. And so the two of them went on. Fifty men of the company of prophets also went and stood at some distance from them as they both were standing by the Jordan. And then Elijah took his mantle and rolled it up and struck the water. And the water was parted to one side and to the other until the two crossed on to dry ground. And when they had crossed, Elijah said to Elisha, Tell me what I may do for you before I am taken from you. Elisha said, Please let me inherit a double share of your spirit. And he responded, 
You have asked a hard thing, and yet if you see me as I am being taken from you, it will be granted you. And if not, it will not. As they continued walking and talking, a chariot of fire and horses of fire separated the two of them, and Elijah ascended on a whirlwind into heaven. And Elisha kept watching and crying out, Father, Father, the chariots of Israel and its horsemen. But when he could no longer see him, he grasped his own clothes and tore them in two pieces. May God bless this reading of Holy Scripture. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, let us pray. O Lord our God, may the words that I speak and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, Lord, our rock and redeemer. Amen. Carolyn Crowder has created a documentary. The title of the documentary is At the River. At the River. And it addresses a part of the history of the civil rights movement that is not well known. Uh, in the, in the, the film, she interviews... 50 Presbyterian clergy from the Southern Presbyterian Church. She addresses 50 Presbyterian clergy who have advocated for civil rights and whose congregations made an impact during the 1960s. And these pastors are all, in the interviews, in their 80s and 90s. And they talk about their experience, their triumphs and their lows, the times they were assaulted, the time they received death threats, all as they struggled to speak the truth and do the right thing. You know, I haven't seen the film yet. There, have been, there was a showing in Richmond not long ago, and I wasn't able to see it. And she's hoping to get it on PBS or on the History Channel at some point. Uh, maybe we could even think about hosting a screening. That would be kind of fun to see. But anyway, I've seen the trailer. And the trailer is just so moving. I just found it so moving. I just wept through the whole thing. Because these are people who I knew and know. I mean, the Presbyterian Church is not that big. And there's, you know, I'm looking at there's George Stroop. There's John Kuykendall. There's Willie Thompson. All these people that I've known over the course of my ministry. And when I was in seminary, people who would show up at seminary events, and, you know, I looked up to them. They were my parents' age, right? And, uh, and here they were telling uh, the story of their attempts at faithfulness. And I was so struck as I listened to the parts of the trailer about how none of them have any bitterness over things that they experienced that would sour most souls. They were men of, and all of them were men, of great faith. Great faith who told the truth in a difficult time and led their congregations to make an impact. I bring this up today because today's passage talks about the passing of generations from Elijah to Elisha. It is a story about how God's power remains with God's people through time. Elijah, of course, is the greatest prophet since Moses. Greatest prophet since Moses. When Jesus appears on the Mount of Transfiguration, who is there? Moses and Elijah. And there's a reason for that. It's because Elijah was the indispensable prophet during a time of tremendous upheaval and darkness. Ahab was on the throne. The Bible says that Ahab was the worst king that Israel had ever had. He was a terrible king. He, he brought in the worship of Baal. He built a pagan temple and worshiped there and sacrificed there. And Elijah was God's instrument to demonstrate that Yahweh is the God of life. And he confronted Ahab for murdering Naboth and stealing his vineyard. And Lord knows, Elijah did not have an easy life. He had a very difficult life. One of the Sundays in this series on Elijah's life, we looked at when Elijah was all alone and thought he was the only prophet left in Israel that all the others had been killed. And still, even though his life was not easy, he was such a compelling, brave, powerful figure that when he comes up and puts his cloak on Elisha, 
at the call of Elisha. Elisha is plowing with his oxen. He leaves his oxen, never looks back, and follows Elijah. Elisha's willingness to follow Elijah should give us hope when we feel jaded about life. When we start thinking that everyone approaches things sort of transactionally. What's in it for me? I'm looking for what's in it for me. Looking out for number one here. When we start to feel like everything that is good and true and beautiful has lost its luster. Elisha sacrificed it all to follow Elijah. Just like the disciples who've left their nets to follow Jesus. We should never forget that God is attractive People are searching for a purpose. I've been reading this book of boys and men. Have any of you heard of this book, read the book? My wife was the only one who raised her hand at the last, because I've been talking about it nonstop at home. I highly recommend, it's why the modern male is struggling, and why it matters, and what to do about it. It's by a man named Richard Reeves. And it is a really thought-provoking book. He really documents, uh, I think, very well how men in our culture, but also worldwide, are, are not doing well. Not every man. I'm doing fine. Thank you. <laughs> but a whole lot of our brothers are not doing well. Uh, boys are not doing well in school. Uh, they are dropping out of families. One quarter of all children born today in, are being raised in single-parent families in our country. Men are dropping out of work. One quarter of the men who have only a high school education are, don't hold a job. The dropping out of church... No, he, he connects, in one chapter, he connects these men who've dropped out of work and family and church and faith. He connects these men, these are the very men, he says, that another team of sociologists say are dying deaths of despair. They're the men who are dying from opioid addiction. They're the ones who are dying by deaths of suicide very same men. They're the same men who find extremist groups attractive. And they find them attractive because they no longer have church, they no longer have work, they no longer have families that give them a sense of purpose in this life. And the extremist groups give them something to fight for. People are literally dying for the gospel power of the good and the true and the beautiful, the power of God to attract and call people to a new way of life, a transformation to give their whole lives in service to God and to neighbor. Because that's what God summons us to do. We should never underestimate how attractive that is and how much people need it. Elisha left everything to follow Elijah. And in today's lesson, Elijah is making a farewell tour. He leaves Gilgal and goes down to, to uh, Bethel, and he goes from Bethel to Jericho, and then he's to, going around. And you remember back in the day when he was the only prophet left in Israel. I'm the only one left, Lord, but here, now, today, there are communities of prophets in these other places. He was the indispensable one. And so he makes his farewell tour. And in all these places where Elijah goes, they tell him that Elisha is, being, is going to be taken away. The Lord is going to take Elijah away. All these prophets tell Elisha, and, and Elisha says, I know, be silent. They can all see it. The end is coming. They will not always have Elijah with them. Three times in our story, Elijah tries to create distance between himself and Elisha. Three times. I don't know if you picked up on that. Three times he says, stay here, as he's leaving Gilgal. Stay here, I'm going to Jericho. And Elisha says, God forbid it! He leaves, 
he leaves Bethel to go to Jericho and he, and he says to Elisha, stay here. Again, Elisha says, God forbid. Three times he says, I'm going to the Jordan. Stay here. He says, I have to go with you. I have to go with you. And you, you wonder why Elijah would want to create this distance between Elisha and him. Why would he want to create this distance? Maybe it is because he knows. Maybe he knows that we want to hold on to our prophets because they've channeled God's truth and goodness and power. We don't want to let them go. We still want more insight that they may have to give. We want more truth that they have to impart, more blessings that they have to share. You know, I think about the people in the documentary, all these people that I've known my, my whole ministry, people I looked up to and respected, who, who made an impact on this country, made it, turned it for the better. I think of Ron Shriver, went to Union Seminary over here, and then later, after being a pastor, went to Union Seminary in New York City, was the professor of ethics there, was the president of the seminary, saved the seminary. I've, every year, for the, like the past almost 30 years, I've been going to the Society of Christian Ethics meeting. It's a professional society meeting, and I, one weekend a year, I, I've spent with Peggy and Ron and gotten to know them and gotten to know a little bit about their family and and in 2021, he passed away. And, you know, I was thinking about going this year, coming up, and I'm, I don't want to let him go. I don't want to let him go. It's not going to be the same without him there, and without Peggy. Like most of us Presbyterian ministers, we marry way above our station in life. Elijah says to Elisha, stay. He's trying to create distance. And I suppose you could say it works. And it doesn't work. It doesn't work in that Elijah follows him every place he goes. But it does create a distance between desires. Elijah wants to, knows that he's not always going to be around and Elijah's got to let him go. He's trying to create the distance, but Elisha says, God forbid. So there's a new distance that is created. Elijah is no longer Elijah's servant who carries out Elijah's commands. He does what he thinks God wants instead. And in this, he reminds us that our calling is not simply to follow the prophets. Our calling is to follow the God of the prophets. And that is the only way the prophets arise to speak to each generation. It is no surprise, it seems to me, that Elijah asks Elijah for a double share of his spirit. When we take in the measure of the great prophets who've gone before us, we wonder, are, are we up to this? Can we do what they did? Elisha says to Elijah, I need twice as much. And Elijah replies, you have asked me for a hard thing, but if you, if you see me taken away, you'll get it. And if you don't, you won't. Elijah makes no promise. This is because he can make no promise. It is not his to give. And then the chariot of fire sweeps down and carries Elijah away, and he is gone. And all that is left is Elijah's mantle. I don't know if you noticed, at the end of the story, Elijah takes his own clothes and rips them in two. Immediately after our story, the next thing he does is he, is he takes up Elijah's mantle and rolls it up. And he touches the water. And if you recall in the story, Elijah did the same thing. He took his mantle and touched the water. Do you remember what happened when he touched the water with his mantle? The water parted. Who else parted the waters? Who else? Moses. Moses parted the waters. 
Elijah has the power of Moses. And when Elisha takes up the mantle and touches the water, the water parts and he walks across on dry land. And the message in this is that God's power continues to be with his people. We who know the gifts of the Holy Spirit know this. The God of power and truth continues with his people. And yes, we may have days like Elijah when we feel like there are setbacks. There may be days when it feels like evil is winning, when the challenges seem great, when our limited resources seem limited and we, the, not matched to the needs that are before us. But we should remember, God has not forsaken us. The God who carried his people out of slavery in Egypt to freedom is with us. The God who enabled Elijah to speak the truth in his day through, is with us. The God who raised Jesus from the dead is with us. The same God who spoke through the prophets in every age is with us. And this is why we worship the God of the prophets, the God of life. Because this is the power that moves the planets transforms human hearts and brings us new life. Let us pray. Lord our God, give us your power this day. So that like Elijah, we may channel the flourishing that you wish for every one of your creatures, every child of God. Just as Elijah did for the widow of Zarephath. So we may call people to the living God, just as Elijah did when he called the people to turn from Baal to you. May we also have the spirit of truth, just as Elijah did. And he confronted Ahab and Jezebel over their greed and murder's work in killing Naboth and stealing his vineyard. Lord, give us power for this day. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let us rise in body and or in spirit and sing hymn number 65.
Christians, what do you believe? We trust in God, whom Jesus called Abba, Father. In sovereign love, God created the world good and makes everyone equally in God's image, male and female, of every race and people, to live as one community. But we rebel against God. We hide from our Creator. Ignoring God's commands, we violate the image of God in others and ourselves. Accept lies as truth exploit neighbor and nature, and threaten death to the planet entrusted to our care. We deserve God's condemnation, yet God acts with justice and mercy to redeem creation. In everlasting love, the God of Abraham and Sarah chose a covenant people to bless all families of the earth. Hearing their cry, God delivered the children of Israel from the house of bondage. Loving us still, God makes us heirs with Christ of the covenant. Like a mother who will not forsake her nursing child, like a father who runs to welcome the prodigal home, God is faithful still. Amen. You may be seated. Let us pray. For your world and your children, we bring our prayers to you, God of love. We pray for those who are misunderstood, for those who are abused. May there be loving care. For those who have not known love, for those who struggle to care, may there always be another chance. For those who live in fear, for those who bring fear to others, may there be justice and peace. For those living with wounds, for those confounded by death and loss, may there be hope for new life. For those who want to understand more, for those who are content, May minds and hearts always remain open. For your world and your children, we open our hearts, O Lord. Hear our cries and petitions, and lead us, O beckoning God. As you moved in the lives of Elijah and Elisha, the disciples, the Apostle Paul, your son Jesus, we beg you to move in our lives, inviting us to journey to unknown territory, to listen for your voice, and to sp speak your prophetic word, to serve your people, to teach, to encourage, to give generously, to lead humbly and to always show mercy to a world that often doesn't want to hear. But we know you can empower us by your spirit and grant us the courage we need to journey in your ways of trust. And above all else, help us, Lord, to always listen and speak your truth. And in this, we accept your commission to be your servant people, passing on our faith given through your Son, Jesus Christ, our risen Lord. Amen. 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 Now, let us all join our voices together with the words the Lord Jesus Christ taught, him, taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. 
Now let us present God's tithes and our offerings.
Gracious God, we give to you out of the abundance of your bounty. We give to you as an act of gratitude and thankfulness for all that you've entrusted to our care. Teach us, Lord, to be good stewards of everything over which we have authority. Our time, our talents, our treasure, even the spiritual mercies in Christ Jesus. And use these gifts that we offer to make known the glory and strength and power of your Son, Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. Now let us sing hymn number 643. May the grace and peace of God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be with you and with those whom you love and with those only God can love, wherever they may be, this day, henceforth, and forevermore. Amen. Amen.